present some of the work that we've been working on in DAFT. Uh, we actually gave a presentation last year at PyData Global 2022 when DAFT was just a few months old. So I'm really excited to show everyone you know, what we've been working on and some of the, the recent updates and how kind of the whole vision of the DAF data frame is really, really coming together. Um, during this session, I'll be doing a bunch of demos, which will take a little bit of time to run, uh, sometimes between a minute and, or two. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we can actually jump into those questions as we go through uh, the demos when, whenever we have time uh, in between. So let's get started. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, so yeah, I'm a co-founder at a company called Eventual. Um, we're the ones maintaining Daft. Um, prior to this, I've worked at Biotech and Autonomous Driving, mostly working on distributed data systems, building these data systems for machine learning workloads, um, dealing a lot with cloud infrastructure, a lot with distributed data infrastructure, et cetera. And now I'm a core maintainer of Daft, um, and you can find us at www.getdaft.io. Um, so first, what, what is Daft? Uh, I find it easier to show rather than tell. So I'm going to go ahead and share a uh, notebook where it might be easier to just get a feel for uh, what Daft is just by looking at the notebook. So first of all, Daft is a Python library. You can easily install Daft with pip. I do pip install get Daft and you'll get all of our prepackaged uh, 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 wheels from PyPy. Um, it's a Daft is a cloud-native data frame API, right? So if you're familiar with libraries such as PySpark, Polars, Pandas, Dask, uh, these li libraries are, are, all have kind of a data frame API. Um, very similarly in, in Daft, you can, you can load data frames from various data sources. And when you show the data frame, this is what a data frame looks like. It has rows and it has columns. In this case, there's three columns, the path, the size, and num rows column. Each column has a type, right? UTF-8, int uh, 64, and then this is the data within that column, right? And so Daft allows you to load from a bunch of different sources. It's very cloud native. Um, it even allows you to do things. In this case, I'm actually globbing a cloud path and returning a data frame of all the files from within that path, right? Um, and then, you know, obviously we also support reading CSVs, parquets, JSONs, and reading, you know, uh, thousands of these files uh, at, at a single time. Um, just through these simple APIs, and you just have to give it kind of this S3 prefix to say, hey, I'm trying to hit this S3 source um, in, in the cloud. Um, and yep, so Daft is a data frame. We, will, we have all the other data frame operations that you've, you know, we've all come to expect, like join two tables together, uh, sort the data frame, create a new column using transformations of previous columns, filter a data frame, et cetera. Um, and Daft also supports a full kind of cost-based query optimizer to optimize your queries before actually executing. So that's all fine and good, right? But what makes Daft special? There's a whole bunch of data frame libraries out there. Why did we try to build Daft? Uh, and what, what, what is the special sauce? And so Daft is really good at what we call complex data types. So these are things such as you know, URLs and images and tensors. And these are types uh, in Daft that are uh, defined in our, on our data frame um, but when you, you define the operations in Python, so like this, you say, you know, perform a URL download on the path column and then perform an image decode on the uh, new data column. And Daft will then actually run everything in Rust, which makes it really, really fast. Uh, we use a lot of uh, cool async Rust and bind it to Python to make this work. Um, but yeah, so you'll notice here that Daft has, you know, native types for um, bytes columns, it's called, uh, this data column is type binary. And then we have also native types for uh, image columns. Uh, in this case, uh, these are the images that we've downloaded uh, from these URLs. And so it's really easy to go from you know, URLs to like binary data to images, to resize images, to tensors. Uh, all these data processing uh, tools are kind of built into Daft uh, uh, for you and run really, really efficiently. And last of all, Daft is uh, distributed meaning that we support execution both on a local Python multi-threaded backend, which is what I'm using right now. This is running on my laptop. Uh, or if you need to use a cluster of machines, you can connect it to a Ray cluster. It's very simple to do that. You just kind of call this Daft context set run array. And then now all of a sudden your Daft data frame with the same syntax has access to, you know, a thousand cores and uh, uh, terabytes of memory 
uh, if you run stuff in the cloud. Um, so that's kind of a brief introduction to, to Daft and some of the motivations behind why we wanted to build Daft uh, uh, and saw this gap in the ecosystem for distributed data frames that were really, really good at this type of data processing. Um, yeah, and today's, uh, so, so what's, what's new since uh, last year, right? So since last year, we've built in a lot of our Rust core internals in Daft. Uh, we've seen a tremendous speed ups in Daft execution through that. Uh, we've built a lot of native types like images and tensors and, and embeddings, um, URLs and operations on those types. Uh, we've also been running a lot of benchmarks. You can check out our blog uh, to, to see how fast we run on one terabyte worth of uh, very typical database TPCH benchmark. Um, and today's talk, we're gonna talk about how Daft has really, really built on its uh, IO layer to pull data very, very efficiently from S3 uh, and the cloud in general. And so to motivate the talk, why do we care about cloud IO performance in the first place, right? Um, I'd argue that it's probably uh, the most important thing when, when we're talking about performance of data frame libraries uh, in the real world, because oftentimes the data doesn't just sit on your machine, the data you know, sits somewhere in the cloud, right? So this is kind of the setup usually for a real world scenario of querying data. Uh, you have object storage, something like AWS S3, which we will be using in our demos today. And you have your query engine. This can be Pandas, Polars, uh, Daft, uh, PySpark and any query engine. Really, the query engine might be distributed, meaning that it's, in, it's installed across multiple nodes and machines. Um, and now, the first thing you have to do when you run any query, right, is you need to pull down data from object storage. That's like fundamental. You need to grab the data, pull it down uh, to to your machines, right. And then the second thing that's really really expensive in these query engines is inter-node communication, right, because the nodes need to shuffle data amongst each other. Um, for today's talk, we'll focus on the first part, which is how do we, you know, download and deserialize as little data as fast as possible from object storage, right? And how, how can we make this super, super efficient so that in the first phase, we can get data down so that the query engine can then work on it. Um, and how do we measure what is considered good performance? So for the demos today, I'll be running Daft on the local Py runner. Um, on the R5 8x large machine type, it has these characteristics. Uh, the network performance advertised by AWS is 10 gigabits per second. And so if we can hit that 10 gigabits per second, then we know that we're being really efficient with all the network bandwidth that's being provided to us. Um, this machine is fairly large. It has 32 cores and 256 uh, gigabytes of uh, memory. But we'll also see that we're able to process very, very large data sets. Um, even with this uh, 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 setup. And uh, yeah, so without further ado, oh, one last thing, uh, just to help people orientate around what we, all the tools that we're using, I'm gonna be using a tool called IFTOP, um, which uh, when you run it, it will tell you information such as the total amount of data received since, since the start of IFTOP, um, the peak uh, amount of uh, data, that the peak bandwidth that was uh, uh, running since the start of IFTOP, and also uh, the average uh, receiving bandwidth over the last two, 10 and 40 seconds. And so I'll be referring to these numbers quite a bit as we go through the demo, um, because we'll be able to see how much data is actually flowing through the network on that machine. Um, cool. So now that we've got through all the kind of boring pieces, let's go straight to the demos. Um, I'm going to be running Daft in real time. And um, I'll share the other screen. All right. Um, so yeah, this this notebook right now is actually running in uh, on an EC2 instance. So I'm gonna restart IF top. Uh, at, at the bottom here, we'll see the IF top instance running. Oh, I don't know if let's see. I can't drag my face away. So uh, let me make this screen smaller so that we can all see the bottom. Whoops. And drag it to the side. Hmm. It's okay. Well, I guess we'll try to take a look at the uh, 
the peak usage instead of the uh, uh, running usage because I can't seem to get my face out of the bottom right of this uh, screen share. Um, let me try one more thing. Move it to the side. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, but I think we'll try and look at the peak memory utilization instead, which oftentimes isn't as accurate, but we'll see. So first of all, I'm going to use Daft now to just read a bunch of Parquet files. This is about uh, two, 22 gigabytes worth of Parquet files, which is about uh, 44 gigabytes uh, when decompressed in memory. And so when I run Daft and I start reading data, we'll see that um, in this case, actually, you can't really see it on this screen share, but um, IFTOP is also overflowing for some reason, but it peaks at about nine gigabits per second, uh, which is really, really good, right? Because, um, ah, thank you, it, uh, the screen share works now. Uh, so you, you can see that it peaks at about nine gigabits per second. Um, and this query you will complete in about 30 seconds. Oh, whoops, let, let me restart this kernel. I think the kernel crashed. And I'll restart IF top as well. Um, and yeah, so, so that is able to really make use of the uh, uh, network bandwidth here super efficiently. It's pulling data down at about nine gigabits per second. Um, this is a very simple query. It's just grab all the parquet files, put it into a DAF data frame, right? Um, and so we expect it to be able to parallelize in SV super efficiently. Let's now we can try. Uh, what if we only wanted two uh, columns from our data frame, right? Um, Daft does perform a whole bunch of very interesting optimizations here. Um, without optimizations, you'll see that Daft will attempt to run a projection on top of the scan. But then if we run optimizations, Daft will understand that, hey, this projection, actually I can just read two columns uh, from the scan instead. So it will fold that projection into, into your scan operation. And now it will say, hey, projection pushdown, I only want to read two columns from these parquet files, right? And so we'll see now when I run this um, that the uh, network bandwidth is, it goes up to about five, five uh, gigabits per second. Um, and it's very, very fast. This completed in, in three seconds, right? Pulling all that data down because it only needed two columns. And so Daft is able to use you know, that from parquet Parquet is a, a column in the format and only grabs two columns uh, and it's able to pull down this data incredibly quickly from S3. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you, which is I think super cool, is what if you didn't want specific columns, you wanted specific rows, right? And you give it this predicate, um, which is you're saying now, you know, give me only rows where the, uh, the L order key column has values less than 100, right? And so if you run this, Daft is actually able to do this very, very quickly. Naively, you would think that you would need to pull all the data down, run this predicate across all the rows just to, to get the, the rows. But because Parquet has a lot of interesting metadata uh, about those rows, Daft can actually make use of the metadata to very intelligently prune out uh, files even that it doesn't have to be. And so this query where you would think you might need to pull down the entire data set of 22 gigabytes, Daft is able to do in two, two and a half seconds, right? And this is reading from S3. Um, and it's able to do this incredib incredibly quickly, um, uh, yeah, with, without having to pull the actual data down. This is what we call in Daft uh, metadata execution. So the next thing I wanted to show is kind of very near and dear to my heart. I think uh, I've been working on a bunch of problems relating to uh, many, many small files in um, the, the, the cloud, where let's say you have, you know, 10,000, 100,000 small files in the cloud, how does that perform there, right? So we've actually been running a lot of optimizations around this. Um, the first thing is, you know, um, I'm not sure if people have tried this, but listing files in S3 is actually incredibly painful and expensive. Um, I've seen this take minutes even on some certain uh, large data sets. Unfortunately, today I only can show you, I have a 10,000 files sitting around. Um, and so I can show, show that to you. The naive approach for uh, listing these files will take about, let's see, uh, two, two and a half seconds, right? This is listing files uh, using the Amazon Boto 3 library. 
um, which is, you know, deep, I, I've written this code at, at least 20 times in my career so far, where I'm just trying to list files. Let's see how fast DAF can do the same query, uh, listing the, the files in the same bucket and same prefix um, using our from glob path method. It takes 300 milliseconds, right? And this is because we're very efficiently able to run these LS queries and parallelize them uh, for hierarchical uh, data, data sets, which is oftentimes the case where you might have your data in kind of a hierarchy of like year, month, and date. And DAFT is very, very uh, efficient with listing those files. In this case, it's listed about 10,000 files uh, across in this data set in, in 300 milliseconds. And this really adds up because as you go up to 100,000, 200,000 files, right? Um, the, the time taken to list files in a naive way will scale linearly. And uh, DAFT, you know, this, this globbing mechanism that DAFT has is actually integrated with everything else. If you're trying to read Parquet, CSV, and you pass it a glob, um, DAFT is able to, to um, resolve those globs very, very quickly. So that's the first thing you have to deal with when you deal with small files, just listing is expensive. Um, the second thing is that, um, you know, can we read uh, 10,000 small CSV files? And the answer is yes, we can. And one way that DAFT does this is that um, this same bucket with, you know, 10,000 small CSV files, when you try to read it in DAFT, it actually coalesces a lot of these files into one, what we call micropartition. Um, and we do this because we know that these files are small and we can kind of batch the reads to these files to make them incredibly efficient, right? So this is going to run for about a minute. Um, and we'll see that, you know, the bandwidth usage goes up to about 2.5 gigabits per second, which is not great. Uh, but it's actually like already pretty good. Uh, and there are, the, the dev team, we looked at this and we were laughing because there's actually a whole bunch of inefficiencies here. And I think we're actually bottlenecked here, not by bandwidth and by CPU. Um, but the deserialization of CSVs is fairly expensive. And so this is something we're working on. Um, but yeah, uh, reading 10,000 files works flawlessly right now. You do a bunch of coalescing uh, of, of the files. Uh, so while this is running, maybe I can answer one question from Martin. If you have faster IO on S3 with Rust, S3, FS, GCS, FS would definitely be interested. Please contribute back. Um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be interested in, in collaborating. The problem with uh, the FS spec libraries is that they assume uh, file system semantics over S3, right? Which is oftentimes not the best way of thinking about S3. There's a whole bunch of assumptions around read ahead buffering and stuff that doesn't really uh, work well in, in, in a latency bound system like S3. And so we've actually custom built a lot of the things in Daft to, to be, uh, you know, highly parallel reads, do a lot of like replanning up front to understand, uh, you know, uh, ranges and sizes of things that we need to read from S3. Um, cool. So let's move ahead with the demo again. We finished reading those uh, 10,000 CSV files uh, in uh, about one minute. Um, it peaked at about two gigabits per second, two and a half gigabits per second. Um, and the next thing I wanted to show you is, you know, oftentimes when you deal with complex data, unstructured data, you might have a data frame full of like URLs pointing out to different sources, right? Um, so uh, one example could be a data frame like this, where I'm just reading a bunch of JPEG files, right? Give me a data frame full of paths to the JPEG files. And then I want to call URL download on those JPEG files. Um, in this case, I have a magic number here. We're trying to figure out how to do this more intelligently. Um, but when we run this URL download, we can see that like the rate goes up to, it should go up to about nine gigabits uh, per second. It's just maxing out this instance basically and reading these uh, JPEG files super, super efficiently. There's about 40,000 files here, uh, JPEG files, and it's going to be able to do this in about 20 seconds. Um, because we're maxing out kind of the bandwidth uh, utilization on, on this machine. And there we go. This is um, about 13 gigabytes worth of data. If we were observing the uh, total kind of uh, memory that was flowing through, it was about 13 gigabytes. Um, and we did this in about uh, 20 seconds at a nine gigabits per second uh, 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 throughput, which is really, really cool. Uh, mix, this basically makes, you know, reading tons of small, tiny, uh, JPEG files in terms of small, tiny, say, NumPy arrays, super efficient using DAFT and loading that into, into uh, the data frame is incredibly efficient. And the last thing is, you know, uh, if we weren't running a toy example, let's say we were running 
uh, actual query. Uh, this is TPCH query on a one terabyte data set. Uh, question one of TPCH, which is a database benchmark. If you were running this, uh, you'll see that you know Daft will peak at about, in this case, I believe, this will take about two minutes to run, um, but it peaks at about seven and a half uh, gigabits per second, um, which is very good. It's about one gigabyte per second um, on this machine. It's not quite saturating the machine, um, but that's also, you know, this, uh, it's a function of like how many cores are available on the machine and how hard Daft is pushing uh, the resource uh, utilization on this machine. You'll notice that this Q1 query is actually super I.O. bound. Most of the work is upfront and this like scan, uh, scan and then run a couple of things basically um, because uh, yeah, the workload is I.O. bound. Once we're past the scan, the workload completes incredibly uh, fast. Um, so I'm going to hop over to questions while this is running. Um, let's see. So Daniel's asking if AWS Wrangler is planned. Not currently, but if you uh, uh, join our Slack channel and have some suggestions on how you know um, we might be able to package something like that, we'd be interested in learning more. Um, and yeah, so uh, Shaul had a had a question. What is the the window at the bottom? Uh, this was earlier in the talk, uh, but this is a program I'm running called IF Top. Uh, it shows you. Um, the rate of uh, network uh, throughput on, on this machine. And so we're looking at this row, which is the RX row, the receiving. Um, and then this is the peak uh, uh, memory utilization. Um, sorry, the peak uh, network throughput uh, in, in the receiving channels. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, this should complete soon, but I'll just hop over to uh, uh, the main chat. Actually, let's just let it finish. It should be done just about soon. I think it usually completes in about two minutes. And yeah, so you'll see that once we're done with the scan, all these other things are just so incredibly fast, right? <laughs> Basically, all, all the work that had to be done on this query was reading from S3. And once that was done, everything else was like, you know, what was that, five seconds? Um, so yeah, that's Daft, uh, kind of uh, some of the demos I had to show for Daft uh, reading from S3. Um, and let's go back to slides. Uh, so yeah, some final closing thoughts. Uh, does it work at production scale? Uh, yes, we've been working with Amazon. Uh, it's Daft is now reading petabytes worth of parquet files uh, daily at Amazon. Some initial results from them is that they've seen you know, up to 38% increase in, uh, in their workload cost efficiency um, because their workload is fairly IO bound. Uh, just reading parquet files uh, from the cloud. Um, comparisons to other libraries, it's really hard to compare fairly, right? You know, the data is different, the hardware is different, the networks are different. Uh, there was a really good talk at PyData NYC 2023, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, benchmarking Spark, Dask, uh, DuckDB, and Polaris. Uh, highly recommend you give that talk uh, a, a watch. Um, and just looking through that talk, you know, I ran the TPCH Q1 benchmark because that's kind of what the talk dives into. Uh, DAF performs extremely well, uh, given that we're using a much smaller virtual machine for this demo with less network bandwidth. Uh, but again, I think the data formats and, and size and file sizes are very different from what was used in the talk. And so it's not exactly comparable, but given that we're you know maxing out the bandwidth on, on the machine, uh, I'm very confident that DAF is uh, doing pretty well here. Um, and yeah, uh, the main thing we're working on right now at DAF is integrations with uh, technologies uh, like Apache Iceberg, Delta Lake, Hoodie, and Hive, uh, which give us even more metadata on top of your, your files, right? It can tell us things like, oh, for this file, you know, uh, column X has values between five and 100. And so Daft at the planning level can actually do a lot of intelligent optimizations around figuring out which files we need to read, which parts of the file we need to read and doing a lot of intelligent pruning there uh, to make this even faster. Um, and uh, if you like what you see, come chat with us. We'd love to collaborate. My email address is actually down at the bottom there. So feel free to take that down. Um, yeah, uh, that's, that's all I have today. And happy to take any questions. Uh, drop them in the chat.
So there aren't any questions. Daniel, actually, if you're still in chat, I'm curious to learn more about what you mean by um, a convenience package like AWS Wrangler. I'm not familiar with AWS Wrangler, so if you wanted to elaborate, that could be useful. Um, or, you know, just get in touch with me um, on, on my email. We also have a uh, Slack channel that we use, um, a community Slack channel, so feel free to get in touch with me there. Ah, thank you. Okay, so AWS Wrangler makes it much easier to read and write to Athena, for example, um, and it makes the whole AWS I/O to Pandas much easier. Yeah, I've actually found that like the uh, Pi Arrow S3 file system is not bad. Uh, Daft is, depending on the workload, uh, can be much faster than than the Pi Arrow uh, and I guess the Arrow uh, C++ uh, S3 reader. It's not bad, and so if you are trying to read uh, IO into pandas. Um, you can try using daft, which is just daft read, and then you do dot two pandas. That could work. Or you can uh, also just use the pyro one, which is I think pyro parquet dot you know uh, read table, and you have to pass in like a file system object, and then you convert that into pandas. Um, yeah, but maybe I'm guessing AWS Wrangler uh, probably wraps some of that to to make it efficient. Yeah, just that's a quick, uh, uh, I guess, clarification to the, the partnership we have with Amazon. They were previously using Pyro and then they sub substituted Daft in. We were seeing, especially around um, much, much uh, more aggressive column uh, pruning reads, we were seeing Daft outperform Pyro by quite a bit here. Um, so what features of Rust enable this? Uh, yeah, so we are actually using a whole bunch of uh, async Rust in uh, Tokyo, uh, which is the which is an async Rust runtime. Um, and so we're able to run kind of multi-threading, uh, Rust multi-threading, not Python multi-threading, right? So we completely release the gill at that point, which makes it very, very fast. Um, and then we are able to run all of our operations in, in async Rust. Um, on top of that, what we've built is also a fairly sophisticated planning layer around understanding specifically which parts of a file we need to read. Um, we do a lot of intelligent batching of, of requests um, and retry policies with uh, AWS S3 uh, to, to make all this work. Um, AWS S3 has a Rust SDK, which uh, exposes a lot of the lower level, kind of HTTP level um, uh, parameters that we can use to uh, very efficiently query data from S3 and, and apply some uh, intelligent retry policies uh, that can help us work very well with uh, AWS. But we also expose all of these parameters in a config. And so if you have other S3 compatible storage, like MinIO or, you know, uh, I think Apache Ozone is another one, or even a Ceph cluster, you can actually tune these parameters uh, so that you know, the DAF can be well behaved when interacting with your S3 compatible storage. Uh, regarding Microsoft Azure, we haven't optimized it for Microsoft Azure. It works with Microsoft Azure right now. Uh, we accept, I think, AZ uh, colon slash slash and ABFS colon slash slash uh, URLs. But get in touch with us. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're keen to doing more optimizations there as well, given how Azure is, you know, getting a lot of prominence in uh, the ML AI space in general. Yeah. Uh, get in touch with us. My email's there. Uh, just drop me an email. I think we're out of time, right? So, um, Donovan, feel free to take over. <laughs> 